Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, we will be talking today about how to develop more welcoming behaviors and environments and situations. Uh, you can see the slides on the prose version of this talk, the longer version, because I had to trim it down so much yesterday, in github.com slash tute slash talk welcoming people with dashes in the middle. Uh, this will be all published, and I will tell you what did, and I will tweet about it too. Uh, I will start with two quotes, which thankfully I have heard already in this conference. It's good that we are coming to a bit of a convergence of the things we are caring about. The first one is uh, from a book that was published 30 years ago almost, and it's in the pre preface. It says the major problems of our, of our work are not so much technical as they are human and sociological. They developed this idea over the course of that book. These two authors were flying to Australia for consulting, and they were like, we just discovered this, and they developed all this content in that, in that flight, and we still are getting surprised because we still didn't learn the lesson. Thankfully, we are starting to do that in conferences like this one. Uh, the other one is from humanedevelopment.org. We are humans working with humans, developing software for the benefit of humans. So those are two, two quotes to set the tone of this talk. We'll be talking about why should we care about welcoming. We'll be talking about uh, feedback, how to give feedback in a productive way and how to receive it too. We'll be taking, talking about onboarding to open source projects. Uh, we'll be talking about how to work with our flawed brains. We already know about cognitive biases, but I will mention two that I think we don't discuss so often. And I will re relate them uh, to our work as contributors and maintainers of open source projects. I was going to talk about microaggressions, where I removed all that content. We don't need to talk it again. And then we'll talk about how to make this expected and normal and common instead of something special that a few people care about. So why should we care? Uh, as professionals, there, there's a very concrete reason why we should be caring. And it's more different people see more different aspects of the single product we are building. Concrete examples, examples about this are the glass staircases that we had in the Apple stores. Uh, no women were there wearing skirts and knowing what problem would arise from glass staircases. How did that get through these uh, architects and engineers? And our example were the crash dummies. Until 2011, they were not required to have female dummies. This was a problem while designing airbags. This was a <laughs> quite heavy problem. And not so dramatic example is the Apple Watch. If you have tattoos in your wrist, it won't sense that accurately your pulse. But there's another more relevant, more relevant in my opinion, as relevant at least, reason why we should care. And it's because we are humans and there's morals that we can follow. I will quote Chad Paitel, the developer and CEO of ThoughtBot, which I didn't mention yet. ThoughtBot is a company I work for, and I thank them for letting me speak here about the things that we consider important. He said in a podcast, when someone has been discriminated against or is in a minority, the status quo is in and on itself wrong. We should do more. Not doing wrong in a state of status quo, which is unfair, is not acceptable. It's, it's just morally wrong. We should be challenging the things that are making our communities less welcoming. And uh, that's a moral reason why we should be caring about diversity. Not only because we are professionals trying to build the be best product we can. So let's talk about feedback. Um, let me go to my notes. Uh, there is a lot of feedback everywhere, constantly. Feedback we are not conscious about. There's implicit feedback on who speaks up and who stays quiet. There is implicit feedback in who is invited to certain threads and discussions, who gets mentioned to, to get uh, uh, opinions in an open source project. Uh, what is not said, what is very considered very important, what jokes do we allow to happen in our interfaces and documentation? All of that is implicit feedback. And if we become conscious about it, we can make sure that we can keep the humor without offending people. I think that's quite important. Uh, another interesting aspect of feedback is how creative people tend to identify themselves with the work they produce. Um, and so um, recently, for example, I saw this quote in the Slack room of my work. We were making fun of legacy code, which was so terrible in our opinion. And somebody said, instead of laughing about this code, why don't we study how did it come to be? And what do we not like about it? And how can we avoid from happening it again in the future if that's what the client wants? This person was conscious and was sharing that consciousness that code is the result of a system. Nobody's guilty. And we should be talking about it that way so as to not offend the teams working behind of it. 
Pixar has this concept of plasing. They came up with a great flow to discuss creative ideas. They said, they're bringing this from uh, improvisation. If you do theater, you might recognize this. Accept all ideas, don't reject any idea. Don't use language like yes, but, use language like yes, and. Only challenge an idea when you have something better to propose. You can't say this is not a good idea and just be done with it. They said that this, been, this has been very successful in making people feel comfortable in rather awkward situations. And they said that they managed to make this a requirement and a flow that everyone follows because the leaders in the organization were vocal about following it and were actively disencouraging people not following this flow. So the flow was important for them, but the practical, practically to implement it, they say that the leaders doing what they say they wanted to do was key. So uh, that's important as open source maintainers probably. So good feedback is actionable, specific, it's kind. For example, if you say something like, you always do that thing that's bad for the team, <laughs> that's ne none of those things. But if you say something like, when X happened, you did Y, what do you think about doing C instead? Then that's all of those things. Um, feedback should be encouraging and should be within the scope of, the, of, of skills of the recipient. Um, every one idea that I constantly keep in mind while having any human conversation, really, not only about feedback and code reviews and in the office, is that every, every person knows something that I don't. Every person is unique. Every person has a unique set of experiences and, and formation and interests that make them particularly interesting to me to learn from. So this has been very important for me. It's a, like a, it's like a long-term vision that allows me to apply many of the little rules that we study automatically. Everyone has something new to say to us. So that's about feedback. Let's talk about how to onboard people um, in our open source projects. The first interaction that a user will have with our project is a landing page or a readme, uh, readme document in GitHub. Those are the landing pages of our project in startup -y terms. Uh, there we should be saying, how do we communicate? Where do we conduct these discussions? Uh, how do we contribute? What, what's our code of conduct? And so on. And they, it should be all verbatim in the readme, or it should be linked to those resources, but it should certainly be in that first page so that the newcomers don't get confused. A new open source project is an enormous bag of things which are interrelated, like documentation and code and communication channels and, and services like CI and so on. And it can feel very daunting for something starting a bootcamp to go into it. But if we have this readme document, and if we tag our issues, then we are giving them more of a breadcrumbs, uh, more of breadcrumbs to follow so that they can use the skills they have in the best way for that project. Um, mm -hmm. Another good thing to do is to give fast code reviews. In this comic, somebody says to another person, how are you doing? And the other person says, well, <laughs> let me think how to answer that question. And the other person is like, what's going on? How are you doing? Oh, sorry, I'm fine. I was just like coming up with the best answer. Uh, the same can happen in pull requests. If somebody sends a sizable pull request, we might want to wait until we can give them a thoughtful code review or a thoughtful answer. Uh, but then that person, Mozilla, has been conducting experiments. If that person has to wait for a week, it's highly probable that they won't come back, that they will just forget, that they won't continue contributing. They will feel like we left them without an answer when they were contributing work to our projects. So something good to do is to say, thank you so much. Your contribution is great. I didn't ask for it, and I have it here. I will leave you now this one comment, and in one week, when I have more time, I will give you a more proper code review. Thank you again. Something like that, so that we don't leave this awkward silence in the middle that can draw people out, especially people who are new. Uh, by definition, when you're new, you have much to learn. You don't know how things work, and you have lower confidence. So if somebody's not answering, it might feel that they left you without an answer, that they ignored you. We don't want to convey that feeling to newcomers. Actually, I'm thinking of a robot now <laughs> that should answer automatically in our names. Thank you. <laughs> I may come back to you in two days. Can you take a note of that, please? I like that idea. <laughs> uh, during code reviews, try to respond to every comment, same thing. A PR can have like 50 comments with little questions in each line. If you don't respond to one of them, it can feel like that. Try to respond to everything, even if it's just a plus one, or, or I don't agree with that, or whatever. If you disagree strongly and you feel strongly about something, 
consider giving yourself some time. Yesterday we heard like that in Twitter you can actually think and breathe before you write. Same happens with GitHub. <laughs> um, don't assume people know your context. Using words like obviously, when it's not obvious to you because you're starting, is terrible. <laughs> it harms directly your self-confidence. Something that should be obvious for everyone. It's not for myself. What's wrong with me? Well, nothing. What's wrong is with the language. We shouldn't use those words in places where we expect newcomers. Newcomers that we don't know their background for. And the previous comments on feedback apply as well. Another uh, thing that I'd like to talk about is a talk that Fat gave in a conference a few years ago. He released Twitter Bootstrap a few years ago. He was so happy. He said, I created this front-end framework. I love it so much. This is my little puppy. I'm proud of it. I will publish it and let the world use it and fall in love with it. And it certainly happened. Everyone started using this project. And so Fat <laughs> saw this little beautiful puppy growing into an enormous dog, dog that didn't even fit in his apartment. And so he was like, I have to go for a walk with the dog, and I have to feed it, but I don't have enough food for it, and people are waiting on me for issues and pull requests and so on, and I just don't have time. I feel so guilty, and I'm starting to burn out. I don't know what to do. Uh, he started a great conversation about guilt and expectations and open source. His case is an outlier. For, <laughs> for more same cases, I have a little rule that I learned that was useful, and we are applying at ThoughtBot, which is having canned responses. Let's, think, let's say that you woke up today, Saturday morning, Seattle. You get a beautiful morning coffee. You're in a good mood. You are well rested. You're coming from the east, so you have extra hours to sleep. That's beautiful. <laughs> somebody somebody uh, sends a, a PR, a, an issue to your project, but it's not very well written. It's not clear what you're asking. You need more information. It might be a bug in your project. It might be a bug in their system. You don't really know. It might be a bug in another related project. And so you write down, you say, thank you so much for your submission. This is useful. Now we need more information. Can you please uh, give me steps to reproduce them? You link to your bug report, needsmore.info. And so <laughs> this person can follow some steps. And uh, you say, uh, I need to reproduce to be able to fix it. So let's work through it. Give me the version number of the libraries you're using, and so on. And you're proud of yourself. You're like, I hate this person so much. I gave them such a thoughtful answer. Uh, how can I be this person always, having a morning Seattle coffee after oversleeping? And we can't, we really can't as humans, but we can have little tricks that allow us to behave that way always and even spending less time. That answer, we save it in a text file somewhere, or in a GitHub repo or whatever. And then we just copy paste it whenever somebody sends a bug report with not enough information, which is 99% of the cases. <laughs> so we can be answering that way every time uh, without spending more than a minute. And we can do this for every other case that this happens. So if the issue is not a bug, and so it doesn't belong here, but in Stack Overflow, it can be rude to say that in just 10 words. So let's, let's write two paragraphs. Uh, issue is, to, is specific to your app. It's not with the library. Issue is stale, and it's abandoned. We close it. It's an unclear request that I just spoke, spoke about. All of those can have their own kind responses. I've been maintaining a few very popular projects at ThoughtBot since I started. And I wrote the things that I learned in this book, Maintaining Open Source Projects. It might be useful for you. It would have been so useful for me two years ago. I wish it had existed before. Because it didn't, I, I started working on it. It's in beta, so now it's cheaper. And the two par chapters that I need to write will be there by January. The winter is a good time to write. Um, I'll speak now about how am I doing with time? I'm already over time. I won't talk about biases. We all will know about that, and it's in the internet. I will speak about how to make this um, normal, how to make this something that we expect and happens every day. I recently received a visit from a person who said, when you're on stage, I pitched the, the talk to them. When you're on stage, tell them that the community, the tech community is not diverse because it's, um, because, uh, it's, it's all right, because it's how it should be. We are all hypocrites. We don't want to change things. And it made me think a lot. I certainly disagree. But it made me think, if we all think that way, it doesn't make sense to work on this. Should I be giving this talk? Should we be worrying? Or should we accept that we are just flawed humans? But I remembered slavery, and I remembered women's suffrage, and I remembered uh, same-sex marriage and equal pay. And all of this seemed like impossible changes of consciousness society-wide, but were, happened. And seemingly, people changed opinions from one day to the other. But it's not opinions that changed. People knew that this was wrong. What changed, I believe, is that it became common knowledge 
that these things were going on. A great story to speak about common knowledge. Common knowledge is the idea that we know something, but we also all know that we all know that something. So now it's comfortable to speak about it. For example, uh, when Lauren yesterday said <laughs> talking pay is good, not only did we already know, it was obvious to us that we should be talking pay, we now know that we all know that. So we can now all go on the 1st of May or tomorrow or whenever, talk about it safely without incurring risk. I have two other examples, but I won't have time to quote them. Um, I love this, this topic. Uh, <laughs> there's a naked emperor example. You might know that story. It's the same thing. Um, so common knowledge, uh, the idea is that stating something publicly, even when it's obvious, can change how people think and behave. And what I want us to do is to start talking about these things so openly with conferences like this one, so that we share, as much as Lawrence shared the top pay thing, we shared how the microaggressions that we just did too, and the gender and race uh, biased ratios are just wrong, and we should be improving them, and we should take pride when we improve them and broadcast that, so that instead of awkward topics, they are as comfortable as now slavery is. Slavery seems like something from the past, but sometimes it was as taboo as pay. I want to do that. I want us to keep calm and have these difficult conversations constantly. Thank you for this conference, and thank you for coming. <laughs>